All right, kids, being a father, I sometimes wonder what's going to be the thing that I say, which makes my children say, my daddy used to say. It's like my father always told me, something, 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 stack that cheese. I mean, I kind of already have a catchphrase and a slogan, a news anchor sign off, but those don't count. I stole them from song lyrics. However, I'm working on not saying I told you so. Don't want to be an arrogant, boastful jerk when I'm right, like I was in this video here. Okay, that was the last time. But there's this thing that people of a certain political ideology do where they pretend like there is no system in America negatively impacting anyone of any color, especially since the 60s, until there is. We also have a federal government that pays single women more not to have a man in the house than to have a man in the house, contributing to an epidemic of fatherlessness. And I think that goes hand in glove with the education crisis as well, because we have to remember education starts with the family and the nuclear family is the greatest form of governance known to mankind. That was presidential candidate Vivek Ramaswamy, voted most likely to raise their hand in the shape of a V in order to get the teacher's attention and answer questions while in class. I'm not making this up. Podcast host and contributor for ESPN, Pablo Torre, said that's what Devek did when they were classmates at Harvard. And I'm not even sure if Ramaswamy denies it. Anyways, when Vivek says, we have a federal government that pays single women more not to have a man in the house, he's referring to federal welfare benefits paid out during the war on poverty starting in the 60s. Conservatives consider this time period from then on in America to be a welfare state. President Lyndon B. Johnson called it the Great Society. Now, as of me writing this, we're three weeks away from the 60 year anniversary of LBJ's message to Congress on the state of the union, where he said, amongst other things, this administration today, here and now, declares unconditional war on poverty in America. And our aim is not only to relieve the symptom of poverty, but to cure it and above all, to prevent it. Before I continue, you should know that many of the War on Poverty's programs like Medicaid, Medicare, Food Stamps, Head Start, Job Corps, Vista, and Title I are still in place today. But the Nixon administration pretty much took the Office of Economic Opportunity apart, gave those pieces to a number of other federal agencies, and eventually the office was renamed in 1975 and then shut down for good in 1981 by Ronald Reagan whose name I'm sure will pop back up in this video somehow because, you know, you can blame him for everything. Even with that, President Bill Clinton, quote, ended welfare as we know it with the Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Act of 1996. So let's talk about rates of babies being born out of wedlock, marriage statistics, and what it means to be fatherless. However, I want to focus on what, say, a presidential candidate can actually do about it. Do you, have you not done anything to combat fatherlessness? You, are, you, are, you, you, you just now acknowledged, in your opinion, that what I just now said wow. isn't even a problem. Larry, please answer what have you done to combat fatherlessness? I'm waiting for Rachel to answer my question, then I'll respond. I've already answered that question. So, so you want me to respond to a problem, to no, answer no, what Larry, It's I'm, your I'm, campaign, Larry. <laughs> Larry, this is your campaign. Your campaign is about fatherlessness. I'm giving you the floor to talk about how you have combat fatherlessness because you say it is such an issue in this country and you don't want to answer the question. I'm happy to answer the question, provided that you acknowledge that there is a problem. Uh, Larry, get the fuck out of here. Larry Elder, who goes to a barbershop and asks for the Thomas Sowell, I just know it, brings up fatherlessness all the time. Here he is talking about it while wearing a shirt that says, worked for my privilege, proving that he has no idea of what privilege means. Larry Elder approved of Vivek's message about fatherlessness. Elder was a 2024 presidential hopeful. You may not know it seeing how he just lost his bid to become the governor of California just a few years ago. And you haven't seen him on the GOP debate stage where, and this is true, he blamed someone else for holding him back. Keep that in mind as I tell you that I went looking into Larry Elder's platform for policy ideas to see what he would do about babies being born out of wedlock. And it turns out that he wrote two opinion pieces about fatherlessness this past year, both in Newsweek, one called Racial Trauma Isn't Real, The Epidemic of Fatherlessness Is, and this other one, Systemic Racism Isn't Holding Black People Back, Fatherlessness Is. It's here where he says, nearly 70% of black kids today enter the world without the father in the home married to the mother, up from 24% back in 1965, which is a stat he got from this article from Brookings. And 
to give him credit, he was sure to add European Americans to the mix. Quote, this is not just a problem in black America. Nearly 25% of white kids are now born out of wedlock, up from single digits in the 1960s, which he got from National Review. I'll get back to these two sources later. Now, if Larry Elder really wanted to get specific, he would say that white women are currently the fastest growing demographic to have babies born out of wedlock in America. And while that current rate is nowhere near as high as that of Hispanic women, let alone black women, based on its current trajectory, it will be in a few generations. Additionally, a couple can cohabitate, live together without being married, and have a child. A father can also live apart from his child, not be in a relationship with the mother, and still be in that kid's life. Hey, a father can be married to a child's mother, live in the home, and be a deadbeat. So what does fatherlessness really mean in particular? Don't even get me started with how black fathers are more likely to bathe, dress, play, and eat with their children as compared to their white and Hispanic counterparts. And if you were to say that the data from this CDC study I just cited is merely a survey with a small sample size, I hope you also think that the stats for babies being born out of wetlock are misleading as I've just shown. The idea of black people not acknowledging fatherlessness in black communities, or whatever Larry Elder was getting at before he was kicked out of the Higher Learning Podcast without answering the host questions is also misleading. According to the National Vital Statistics Report from 2018, for all racial and ethnic groups combined, 39.6% of births in the United States were out of wetlock. For black people, the number was 69.4%. For American Indian slash Alaska Natives, it's 68.2%. So. It's not just us. And everything I briefly touched on over the course of the previous 90 seconds was also something I said almost verbatim in at least two other videos of mine because black people talk about fatherlessness. Of course we do. I and people like me know that we don't have dads. All the while, marriage rates are declining, not just in black communities or in America, but all over the world, even the most unlikeliest of people are aware of historical precedents and babies being born out of wedlock in other races and ethnicities. And so they aren't. It's the legacy of the welfare state. And by the way, we see Ill illegitimacy rates rising among everybody. Yeah, and, and in other countries. And, mm. Yeah, you know, the, the, the very same thing in England. Um, Moynihan was, was uh, excoriated for pointing this out. 1965, uh, the, the Moynihan re Report. That's right, yes. the Moynihan Report. What, and and what, what is so, people did, took this as a, as a way of uh, putting, putting down blacks. What they don't understand was that one, Moynihan was a scholar who knew that his own group, the Irish Americans, had that very same problem at the beginning of the 20th century. And more importantly, Moynihan's own father deserted the family when he was 10 years old. Oh, I didn't know that. So here's my question, raising my hand like a V. Why does this topic keep coming back to black people? Is it culture? Whose? Fatherlessness, criminality, violence, and a lack of education are all symptoms of poverty. We'll act like conservative and or Asian American based anti-blackness isn't a thing. Maybe I do it Star Trek style. So with not only livelihood, but lives on the line, what will the Larry Elders of the world do about what is deemed to be an epidemic of fatherlessness? Well, these two opinion pieces of his don't say, quote, Republicans have an opportunity to win black votes by speaking directly to black voters, addressing their problems and telling the truth about the solution without saying what the solution is. I guess, don't vote Democrat? As for the article he linked from the National Review, it says, but rather than encourage people to wait until they are married before having children, which is perceived by the left as too religious and patriarchal, it's much easier to talk about institutionalized racism and white privilege and mass incarceration and implicit bias and 1619, isn't it? So merely telling people to stay abstinent before marriage, encouraging people to get married, is that an actual thing that human people do? So if some of y'all know a couple living together, shacking it up, you would say you should get hitched out loud with your mouth? What is the Republican Party going to do? Come up with a, with a slogan? How did that work for Nancy Reagan and just say no? I told you I'd bring that name Reagan up again. I also told you that I wouldn't say 
I told you so though. Shouldn't conservatives be working on themselves to become more desirable? I mean, they're the ones having to hide their political ideology on dating apps. Oh, and if you can't spot a black conservative man, they refuse to get lineups when they get their hair cut. In an analysis of out of wedlock births in the United States from Brookings, they credit what we know and have seen about the decline in marriage in America to a decrease in shotgun marriages, a marriage that is forced because of a pregnancy. Brookings also goes into great detail about how the sudden increase in the availability of both abortion and contraception plays a role in the increase in out of wedlock births. And in a post Roe v. Wade world after the Dobbs decision, would a GOP presidential candidate want to get rid of abortion, birth control, and other reproductive technology? Mm. That's assuming Larry Elder read beyond the Brookings article where it talked about black people. He definitely didn't. Moving on, I want to point out that the Heritage Foundation, a conservative think tank, makes it clear that babies being born out of wedlock is a phenomenon that happens among poor and low income Americans. And they say, quote, if poor women who give birth outside of a marriage were married to the fathers of their children, two thirds would immediately be lifted out of official poverty and into self-sufficiency. This, again, assumes that unwed women aren't in committed relationships or in households with multiple incomes. Heritage Foundation describes self-sufficiency as the ability of a family to sustain itself above the poverty level through its own work and investment without reliance on welfare aid. For, quote, a new generation capable of supporting themselves out of poverty without government handouts. They will go on to say, even in good economic times, the median poor family with children has only 1,000 hours of parental work per year. This is the equivalent of one adult working 20 hours per week. If the amount of work performed in poor families with children was increased to the equivalent of one adult working full time through the year, the poverty rate among these families would drop by two thirds. So how about we raise wages in this country? If someone can only work part time because they're caring for a child or are in school or something like that, they can still make a little bit of money. Hey, throw Universal Head Start on there too. A single parent wouldn't have to pay for childcare, expensive, and could work more hours knowing their child is being taken care of. Plus, is it likely in America anymore to live off of one income while the other spouse stays at home with the kids? Ooh. Better infrastructure and public transportation could get a single parent or a married couple to a higher paying job outside of their impoverished neighborhood without having to buy or pay for a car. Increase the earned income tax credit. Give us universal health care. Paying unplanned out of pocket expenses doesn't help. Around half of the merits on credit reports is medical debt. Uh, see. All of those things will be considered handouts from the government. And they don't want the general populace relying on free stuff, except for recipients of the Homestead Act, Wagner Act, Social Security Act, redlining, and the first GI Bill. Those white people didn't become lazy after what America did for them. It's weird. Which leaves us with messaging in this economy. No method telling people to do better. No sacrifice or investment, no capital, no real backing, support, or safety net. Really, no nothing. Larry Elder ain't going to do nothing about fatherlessness in the black community or anywhere else. Neither will Vivek Ramaswamy. He's too busy swagger jacking Barack Obama and stealing Larry Elder's lyrics. Of fatherlessness. Why then am I running? Because there are several issues that our side is not talking about, if at all. Number one. Look, I could have spent so much of this episode going over poverty rates, how they're measured over time, comparing and contrasting the numbers of those in and out of poverty, whether the war on poverty helped or hurt the previous generations in these United States. Lyndon Johnson and his great society, was it a success or failure? Well, ask a liberal or conservative. Does any of this have any bearing on America today? You know what's interesting to see which systems, structures, and institutions from the 60s people pick and choose to say still affect us. But there's definitely one thing this country did then that it does now. And I knew that America would never invest the necessary funds or energies in rehabilitation of its poor so long as adventures like Vietnam continue to draw men and skills and money like some demonic destructive suction tube. So I was increasingly compelled to see the war as an enemy of the poor and to attack it as such. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who evidently 
had more to say than one stanza in one speech that the right is going to remind us of on MLK's birthday next month because it's the only thing he said that they agree with. He recognized and realized that the war on poverty didn't go far enough and was underwhelming when the Vietnam War was underway. Sometime later, he added, and you may not know it, my friends, but it's estimated that we spend $500,000 to kill each enemy soldier while we spend only $53 for each person classified as poor. And much of that $53 goes for salaries to people that are not poor. Sounds a lot like America today. By the way, in terms of age, Martin Luther King Jr. and Thomas Sowell are only a year apart. Do with that information what you will. We got money for war and genocide, but can't feed the poor. A reverend and a rapper told us so. We're gonna be all right.